Hey everyone, welcome back to What Happened with Jackie Flores. I'm Jackie and I hope you guys are doing super, super well. So welcome to episode 35 of the podcast. So today we're gonna be talking about a very interesting case that revolves around the question, how far would you go for love? Would you move to a different state to be with someone that you love? Would you move to a different country? Would you quit your job for them? Would you kill for them? That's a real serious question. I mean, I feel like the majority of people would never turn to murder as an answer. That's most likely the last thing that people are thinking about when it comes to love. But there are some people that truly believe fighting for true love justifies a murder. Well, that is what we're gonna be talking about in today's video. We're going to be discussing what happened to Manfred and Mauricia von Richthofen. These two were betrayed in such a horrible and unimaginable way by the last person you would ever expect would want to harm them. There is so much information to go over, so with that, let's jump right in and let's talk about what happened to Manfred and Mauricia. Now, there's really not that much information into the childhood of Manfred and Mauricia. Most of the articles really focus on just the case, you know, what happened, the investigation, the trial, etc. So there's not much that we know about what their life was like growing up. We can just start off by talking about Manfred. Manfred von Richthofen was born on February 3rd, 1953 in Germany to his father Joachim and mother Margot. Now Manfred could be a little introverted, but he was a very hardworking and successful engineer. In the 1970s, Manfred went to the University of Sao Paulo for college and that's where he met Mauricia Abdallah. So let's talk a little bit about Mauricia. Mauricia was born on January 22nd, 1952 in Sao Paulo, Brazil to her parents of Portuguese and Lebanon descent. Again, there's not really much that we know about her childhood, but what we do know is that she went on to become a very famous psychiatrist in Brazil. So soon after Mauricia and Manfred met, they fell in love. I mean, they just like immediately hit it off, they clicked, and they just knew that they were meant to be together. They ended up getting married in 1977, and they went to Germany together to get their master's degree. After graduating from their master's programs, they went back to Sao Paulo because Manfred had actually gotten a job working at Dursa, which is a state owned company that managed the entire Sao Paulo highway system. So it was a really good job. They both had their master's degree, so they were just really successful people. The two of them eventually had two children together. First, Mauricia gave birth to Suzanne on November 3rd, 1983. And then a few years later in 1987, she gave birth to their son, Andreas. Now things seemed to be going really well in the household. Mauricia and Manfred were happy about their new family. They were happy in their marriage and things were going so well in their career. In 1998, Manfred was actually promoted to engineer at Dursa, and then Mauricia eventually opened up her own private practice. They both had such incredibly great careers, and because of that, they both believed in the importance of having a very good, high-quality education, and they just wanted their children to have the best. You know, they wanted their children to go to school, to learn, to get a degree, and to have great and successful careers and, you know, just be set in life. They encouraged both Suzanne and Andreas to take up different hobbies and learn new languages. When Manfred would come back from his work, he would bond with his son Andreas by doing some woodwork and gardening together. By the time that Suzanne was 18 years old, she could already speak four languages, which is really impressive, and she was already beginning to study for law school. She had a brown belt in karate, so as you can see, the kids were very educated, they seemed to be very disciplined, and honestly, all the goals and hopes that the parents had for their children seemed to be coming true. Now, a little bit about Suzanne, people describe her as being a little bit shy, but she did have a good relationship with her family and with her friends, who she would actually often buy gifts for. You know, she liked to give gifts to people, so she seemed like a really sweet girl. Now, based on what friends and other acquaintances have stated, the family was really serious. You know, Mauricia and Manfred were very smart people, they were very successful, so everyone just knew them as a very intellectual and just serious family. You know, they weren't the type to throw these big parties and have neighbors over for like a barbecue and just like being very social. Mauricia was a little bit more outgoing, like she could be social, but Manfred was just very reserved and he kind of just kept to himself. The family was also extremely wealthy. They lived in a mansion that was worth what would be equivalent of $600,000, and they pretty much had about what would be equivalent to $17 million in wealth. This mansion was like everything. It's really, really gorgeous. It had a swimming pool, a library, a huge kitchen, so many bedrooms. I mean, it was a really, really nice home. Anyone living in this type of home would definitely feel blessed. 
Now, according to rumors, the family also had about $10 million stored in Swiss bank accounts in Suzanne's name. I'm not sure how true that is. Again, those were just rumors. So as I said before, Manfred and Mauricia encouraged their kids to have hobbies and to, you know, just do things outside of the house. So in 1999, when Andreas was 14 years old, he developed an interest in model aircrafts. And the entire family went to attend a model aircrafts fair with him. At this fair, Andreas met an older boy named Daniel Cravinhos, who was 19 at the time, so five years older than him. Daniel built amazing model airplanes and Andreas was obsessed with them. He wanted Daniel to teach him how to make these models too and his parents agreed. So Daniel kind of became his mentor and he would often take him out on bike rides as well. Slowly, the two of them became close friends and Daniel would come to their house a lot. At the same time, Daniel also attended jujitsu with Suzanne, so they also started hanging out together as well. Daniel was pretty much spending almost every single day at the family's house. You know, he was doing jujitsu with Suzanne, so the two of them actually started to get to know each other a little bit more. And eventually, they started to have feelings for each other. They actually began dating when Suzanne was 16 years old and Daniel was 19 years old. Now, Manfred and Mauricia were okay with Andreas being friends with Daniel because again, they were bonding over a hobby of model aircrafts, but something about Daniel dating their daughter, Suzanne, just didn't sit right with them. They just didn't like that he was older than her, that he didn't really have much ambition. You know, at the time that they were dating, he didn't have a job. So I don't know, I feel like the parents just didn't like him for their daughter and that's totally fine. You know, they felt like he was a really bad influence for Suzanne. Daniel used marijuana daily and he also introduced Suzanne to drugs like ecstasy. They also huffed paint thinners and glue together. Suzanne had also gotten into the habit of sneaking out of the house to go visit Daniel and she would have her friends cover for her if her parents called and asked where Suzanne was. She even skipped her high school graduation party to go be with Daniel. So the more her parents got to know about Daniel, the more they disapproved of him. Which again, I feel like is totally understandable. I don't really think the parents were being that dramatic in terms of not liking this boy. You know, if suddenly Daniel came into their daughter's life and he's starting to make her do drugs, he's making her skip school, he's making her lie, I definitely don't think that's a good influence. So I think it's understandable why the parents were not a fan of Daniel. They just felt like Suzanne had so much to offer. You know, she was a beautiful young girl. She had a bright future ahead of her. She planned on starting her first semester of studying law at university soon. While Daniel was pretty much just a college dropout without a job. Daniel's only source of income was making and selling two model aircrafts a month, which would amount to about $1,000. He also wasn't really interested in studying or working or even finding a career, so he wasn't ambitious at all. Him and his brother Christian also had a reputation of being troublemakers in their neighborhood. So again, all of these things just added up. I mean, I understand why the parents just were not a fan of this. Despite their strong opinion, Suzanne was really in love with Daniel. She would even spend some of her parents' money to buy gifts for him. I mean, honestly, not some of their money. A lot of their money went towards Daniel. Suzanne says that because her parents were so focused on work and just like being successful people, that she felt like Daniel was kind of like a safe haven for her. She felt like she could be herself and just be free with him. She would often take her younger brother, Andreas, to hang out at Daniel's house and they all got along super well. Naturally, like any concerned parent, both Manfred and Mauricia would often ask Suzanne to stop dating Daniel, but she wouldn't listen. Since that didn't work, Manfred tried to, you know, talk to Daniel. You know, he tried to convince him to maybe go back to school, to maybe learn English, to apply himself and to just do something with his life. I mean, he knew his daughter was in love with Daniel, so he just wanted to help him, you know, step up to be on her level. But Daniel wasn't interested in any of this at all. In July of 2002, Manfred and Mauricia went on a one month vacation to Europe. When they came back, they found out that Daniel had moved into their house for that whole month, which the parents were very upset about. Suzanne suggested, you know, okay, if you don't want him to stay here, why don't you buy us an apartment so I can move in with Daniel and we don't have to live at your house anymore? Just crazy. I cannot believe that she just told her parents that. Like, I cannot imagine telling my parents, hey, why don't you buy me and my boyfriend that you don't like an apartment so I can go live with him? It's honestly really crazy, but that just shows like how in love Suzanne was with this boy. So like most parents, Manford said no that's not happening. He said that Suzanne can do whatever she wants if she makes her own money. 
So Manford and Daniel actually got into an argument that day and police had to be called because things were just so heated. Mauricia and Manford tried to send Suzanne to Europe for higher studies to, you know, get her away from Daniel. And when she heard that her parents were going to send her to Europe, Suzanne lied to them and said that she had broken up with Daniel, but she actually hadn't. Mauricia felt relieved when she heard this and she even told her friends that she had successfully gotten rid of Daniel. But as I said, this was a lie and Suzanne continued to see Daniel secretly. Her parents quickly found out about this and of course they were upset that she had lied and that she was still seeing him. On October 26, 2002, Manford went to Daniel's house to look for his daughter but he didn't find her there. However, he did confirm that they were still together. Manford and Mauricia asked Suzanne to break up with Daniel once and for all. They even threatened to cut off Suzanne's allowance if she saw him again. Manford and Mauricia thought that they had given Suzanne a stern enough threat and that she would reconsider her decision to be with Daniel. Other than this disagreement, things seemed to be going well for the family. You know, besides this big problem with the relationship, Suzanne was in college at this point, you know, studying to be a lawyer and Andreas was in high school. Manford had just been made an engineering director at Dursa and he was overseeing the formation of the city's premier metropolitan ring road. So, I mean, things were going well for the family. I feel like at this point, the parents were hoping that the relationship would kind of just like fizzle out, but Manford and Mauricia had underestimated the bond that Suzanne and Daniel shared, and they had no idea that their daughter's relationship with a boy would lead to their murder. Let's take a break to hear from our sponsors who help make the podcast possible. If you're like me, you have no idea how to pack for your trip. I try to be limited and selective about what outfits I'm going to pack, but in the end, I just give up and stuff everything into a suitcase that's bursting at the seams. Not a cute airport look. But with base, there's room for everything. 15 pairs of underwear for a weekend trip, no problem. Gifts for extended family members, throw them in. A change of shoes for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, bring them all with Base. Base was created by actress Shay Mitchell to make sleek and affordable bags, luggage, and accessories designed to help you travel effortlessly while still looking fashionable. Base has been thoughtfully made by a team who knows everything you would want in a perfect piece of luggage. 360-degree gliding wheels, a cushioned handle, built-in weight indicator, washable bags for your dirty clothes, and all the interior pockets you need to keep organized. Their luggage comes in multiple sizes and colors, and for shorter trips, the weekender bag is super functional and even has a place to store your shoes separately. And you don't even have to worry about a base bag in cargo or overhead. They are built to withstand travel and look cute at the same time. Till date, they've gotten over 30,000 five-star reviews. So whether you're packing for a quick trip or looking to breeze through the security line, Base has your personal items covered. I am such a big Base fan. I have the mini weekender, the big weekender. I have the big luggage and the mini carry-on. So literally my entire luggage system and collection is just all base. Right now, base is offering our listeners 15% off your first purchase by visiting basetravel.com slash what happened. Go to basetravel.com slash what happened for 15% off your first purchase. That's B-E-I-S travel.com slash what happened. And now let's get back to the video. On the morning of October 31st, 2002, the family was up and getting ready for a normal day. 18-year-old Suzanne and her father, 49-year-old Manford, got into an argument and then Suzanne went to go to attend her law school, attend her sociology and foundations of public law class, and was pretty much her usual self. You know, she was quiet, calm, and collected that day. So after everyone, you know, had their day, you know, went to work, went to school, they all returned home and just started getting ready for bed. However, Suzanne had a different idea in mind. At this point, Suzanne had had enough. She knew that the only way that she could continue to be with Daniel and also keep her allowance and all this money was to get rid of her parents. So in the evening hours of that day, Suzanne disabled the burglar alarm to her house and she turned off the security cameras around the house. At about 9.30 p.m., she drove over to Daniel's house. The two did some drugs like weed, paint thinners, and decided that her and Daniel needed to convince Andreas to get out of the family home. You know, they wanted to, you know, sneak him away because they didn't plan on killing Andreas. They only planned on killing the parents. So at about 10.30 p.m., they went to the house and they snuck Andreas out. 
and they knew that their parents were sleeping but wanted to make sure to not wake the parents up at all. So Suzanne and Daniel took Andreas to a nearby cyber cafe called Red Play Internet Cafe to meet his friends and just play video games. You know, they just wanted to plop him down at this cafe so he would be distracted with his friends and the video games while they went back and committed this terrible thing. Okay, I had to get a blanket because it got really cold, but going back to the case, usually Suzanne and Daniel would join Andreas and his friends to, you know, play video games and just hang out. But this time they left Andreas with his friends all alone and then returned back to the house. This was all very normal for Andreas. You know, from his perspective, he was actually thankful for his sister and for her boyfriend for helping him sneak out of the house to, you know, go have some fun and just like hang out with his friends. So to him, this just seemed like, a casual night of just like playing video games, being with your friends, and that was it. When Suzanne got back home a few minutes before 11 p.m., she checked to see if the alarm was still disabled, and then she opened the electric gate. She ran upstairs to her parents' bedroom, turned on a light in the hallway to check if her parents were asleep, and when she didn't hear anything, she knew that they were sleeping. After this, Suzanne went downstairs and she opened the front door for her boyfriend, 21-year-old Daniel, and his brother, 26-year-old Christian, to come inside. The men had pulled their hoods up and they entered the house quietly. Suzanne actually gave them surgical gloves so that they wouldn't leave behind fingerprints and they even wore pantyhose around their heads to prevent their hair from falling anywhere around the house. So this was a very well thought out plan. At about 11.15 p.m., Daniel and Christian walked up to the stairs to her parents' bedroom while Suzanne waited in the living room. Once inside, Christian went over to 50-year-old Mauricia's bedside while Daniel went over to 49-year-old Manford's bedside. Then Daniel and Christian repeatedly hit Manford and Mauricia on their heads with iron rods. But while Manford and Mauricia were severely injured, they weren't dead yet. In cases of severe brain trauma, if the victim doesn't die immediately, their tongue loses support from the base and actually falls back into their throat. And that's exactly what happened to Mauricia and Manford and a bunch of loud and disturbing noises started coming out from their mouths. Daniel freaked out and he actually rushed to the bathroom and he wet two towels and then tried to put these wet towels over their faces so that the sound would drown out and that they would slowly die. But that didn't work, so Daniel ran back downstairs to the kitchen to grab a pitcher of water and decided to try to drown them with it. This actually worked, and it actually killed Manford. But Mauricia was still alive. Daniel then decided to grab a plastic bag, and he tied it around Mauricia's head until she died. After Daniel and Christian were confident that Mauricia and Manford were dead, they informed Suzanne, who came upstairs to check on things. All she asked them was, done? And the boys nodded, which is actually crazy. I mean, this whole plan is crazy and, and to, to begin with. But for her to just say done after her boyfriend and his brother just killed your parents is so disturbing. And it just shows how she didn't even care at all. Now, while Suzanne seemed to be calm about this, Christian was not. He actually started freaking out. You know, he realized what had just happened. You know, he had just killed two people. And the gravity of the situation just really hit him. Now, Suzanne tried to calm him down and reassured him that he did the right thing and that he gave her a new life. After this, the three of them pocketed any money that they could find. They started to kind of throw papers around the house and just like mess up the furniture. The boys handled the upper floor while Suzanne caused a mess downstairs. And the point of this was to make it look like somebody had broken in and robbed the place before murdering Manford and Mauricia. They also got a 38 revolver from the closet, which was behind a false back, and they placed it on the floor next to Manford's bed. In the end, they took about $7,000 in cash, both in US dollars and euros. So after doing all of this, you know, taking the money, setting up the crime scene, you know, just getting everything in order, the three of them left the house. They ditched the iron rods. They ditched the surgical gloves, the pantyhose, and the clothes that Christian and Daniel were wearing during the murder in a random dumpster en route to their next destination. Suzanne and Daniel dropped Christian off at a McDonald's next to the apartment he lived in with his grandma so that he would have an alibi. After that, Daniel and Suzanne checked into a motel called Motel Colonial for $380 a night for their alibi. They, of course, used the money that they had stolen from the house to pay for the room. They spent a few hours at the motel, they got a snack, they smoked a joint, and then they went for a swim before checking out at three o'clock in the morning. How are you just like eating snacks and hanging out with your boyfriend after you just killed your parents? Like it's 
so disturbing and insane. After checking out at three o'clock in the morning, they picked up Andreas from the cyber cafe and they drove him back to the parents' house. Now, when the three of them got home, they all pretended to kind of sneak in without their parents noticing, you know, because they had been out for so long and it was so late. And of course, like Daniel and Suzanne knew that the parents were dead. So there was no point of like sneaking around, but they had to keep the ruse up for Andreas. When they got to the house, which was at about four o'clock in the morning, they found that the front door was wide open. The living room had been torn apart, like there had been a break in just as Suzanne and the boys had intended. Suzanne went to their parents' bedroom with Andreas and pretended to be shocked to discover that both their parents were dead. Daniel called the police at 4.09 in the morning and filled them in on what had happened. The police arrived and they went into the parents' bedroom. They saw both Mauricia and Manford had bloody towels covering their heads and there was blood all over the walls. So police called an ambulance to take the bodies as well as the homicide forensic team who arrived at 7 a.m. Manfred's ribs were broken and his cause of death was determined to be an injury to the skull that killed him instantly. Mauricia's fingers were crushed so she must have tried to protect her head from a second blow. It was clear to them that this was a two-person job because the other would have woken up when they heard the other being attacked. Forensics determined that the time of death was between 10 p.m. and 12 a.m. The police also noticed a revolver on the floor of their bedroom at arm's reach from Manford's hand, but no shots had been fired from the revolver. So this was suspicious and odd to detectives. Now, detectives did question Suzanne and Andreas about this. Of course, Suzanne was putting on her acting face and she was acting like she had no idea what happened to her parents. Her and her brother basically said the same thing, that they both thought that burglars had broken into their home and had murdered their parents. But the police found it hard to believe that this was a burglary. It seemed like both Manford and Mauricia were murdered while they were sleeping, so they weren't an active threat to anyone who was breaking in the house and trying to steal something. You know, any burglar could have been in and out without even having to kill them. So police looked around and they of course noticed that the family had a security system and they discovered that the reason that Marissa and Manford weren't alerted to a break-in and were sound asleep was because somebody had turned off the alarm system from inside the house. And to do that, they would have had to know the codes to the alarm system. There were also no signs of forced entry either, you know, no broken windows or doors, nothing. So with this information, the police believed that Marissa and Manford were murdered by somebody close to them, maybe an employee, a friend, or a family member. The other thing they noticed was that the messy living room looked staged. You know, like the papers all over the living room also seemed like they were placed there carefully as if by design and not like somebody had just like gone through the paperwork really quickly to look for something and had just like thrown them around sporadically. Also, what was weird is that the other rooms in the house were perfectly in place and untouched. The only part of the closet that was touched was the shoe rack, which was in front of where the gun was hidden. Plus, there were so many valuables that had been left behind the house. You know, the four cars were still in the driveway with the keys inside the house. The cell phones and the computers were still in the house as well as expensive jewelry. So it's odd, like if someone was just breaking in to steal something, why would they pretty much leave like all the big valuables behind? And they also left Manford's gun behind. You know, if their intention was to steal, why wouldn't they just take everything? You know, it made it really clear that whoever did this wasn't a very sophisticated and seasoned criminal. So basically meaning that Suzanne, her boyfriend and his brother just didn't really think this through. Like, if they wanted to keep up with the facade, they definitely should have stolen something. So, since detectives believed that someone close to the family must have done this, they started to interview the employees of the estate, as well as the kids, Suzanne and Andreas. Police interviewed a maid who had actually recently been fired from the house, and she had even threatened the family. But after extensive interrogation, they couldn't find any concrete evidence tying her to the murders. As for Andreas, you know, he had a solid alibi. He was at the cyber cafe with his friends playing video games, so that alibi was proven. And as for Suzanne, she said that she was spending the night at a motel with her boyfriend. Now, something about Suzanne's cool, calm, and collected demeanor in her interviews just didn't sit right with investigators. I mean, her parents had just been brutally murdered and she was kind of just like casual about it. You know, Andreas was completely distraught. He was crying, he was heartbroken. He just could not believe that his parents were killed. But Suzanne just didn't show any of those signs. In fact, just the day after her parents were murdered, when police were just beginning their investigation, Suzanne was seen swimming in the family's swimming pool with Daniel. Like what? Like she just lost both of her parents. Like how are you just swimming in the pool? 
Now, of course, some people can go into shock when something like this happens to them, but Suzanne clearly just seemed to be okay with her parents' death and she was just like living her life. Within a week of the murder, she had started inquiring about selling the house, which seemed really bizarre to police. Suzanne had more questions about her inheritance money than she did about her parents' murder. She was already thinking about using the money from her inheritance to actually start a business with Daniel. Of course, all of this behavior made the police very suspicious of her and they all began keeping a close eye on Suzanne. At Mauricia's and Manford's funeral, Suzanne did look upset and distraught in front of her friends and family. Like there's actually footage of this and you can see Suzanne and Daniel there with Andreas and with everyone else and they're like crying. Like Suzanne's like hugging her brother and hugging her family and she just looks so sad about this and Daniel's just there comforting her. And like looking at that footage, knowing what they did is so disturbing. Like I don't know, I don't get how she could do that. They're just both so truly evil. So just hours after her parents' funeral, that day was actually Suzanne's birthday. So she decided to celebrate her 19th birthday with some of her friends at the family home, the home that her parents had just been brutally murdered in. First of all, I'm like, that's crazy that the funeral was held on her birthday. And then second of all, the fact that she had a birthday party just days after her parents were murdered and on the day of her parents' funeral is actually insane. I'm wondering like why do people go to this party maybe they just wanted to like support her and like console her but it's just still so weird so now police were beginning to suspect that suzanne and daniel had something to do with this but they just couldn't prove it they started looking into suzanne daniel and also into his brother christian and that's when they found out that just 10 hours after the murders christian had bought a new bike so Detectives went to the person who sold him the bike and he told them that Christian had paid for his new Suzuki bike, which was about $3,600 in $100 bills. Of course, this is incredibly suspicious since the police knew that the money had gone missing from the family household and they also knew that Christian didn't have money like that. So where did he get this from? Police showed up to Christian's home and they could literally see his brand new bike parked outside of his apartment. Like he wasn't even trying to hide it. Now, Suzanne was actually upset about this. She was mad that he had purchased the bike because he was basically giving them away. And Suzanne and Daniel actually even stopped talking to Christian because of this. On November 7th, the police picked up Christian asking him for his help in identifying a suspect. And he was interrogated at the police station for six hours. And he kind of just kept mixing up his stories of how he bought the bike, how he paid for it, or if he knew anything about the murders. He gave the police three different versions of how he had bought the bike with his own money. At this point, Christian's dad had also arrived at the police station. And in the last hour of interrogation, Christian admitted to his role in the crime and everything else. I mean, he just spilled the beans and confessed to everything. Now, his dad was there. And when he heard that both Christian and his other son, Daniel, were involved, I mean, he just couldn't believe it and he literally just like walked out of the police station. So now that detectives had Christian's account of what happened that night, the police went to go interview Suzanne. Suzanne was still calm and very collected during the interrogation and she denied that she had any involvement in the murders. But then one police officer threatened that they could implicate Andreas for the murder as well. Suzanne didn't want anything to happen to her little brother, so she immediately dropped the act and she confirmed that she, Daniel, and Christian were responsible for killing her parents. On November 9th, 2002, Suzanne and Daniel were arrested and taken into custody. When Andreas heard the news about this, he was just absolutely devastated. He had just lost both his parents and now his sister was going to jail for their murder along with his friend Daniel and Christian who he had considered older brothers. My heart just breaks for Mauricia and Manford who were murdered, but it just also breaks for Andreas. It just seems like he truly did love his parents and he loved his sister. So to learn that your sister manipulated you and convinced you to leave the house under the ruse that she wanted you to have fun and play video games, but in reality, it was just to get you out of the house so she could kill your parents, is horrible. I just can't imagine what was going through his head at this point. And it's just so disappointing and so sad that Suzanne made this decision knowing that it would affect her brother who was just completely innocent to this. I mean, of course the parents are innocent as well, but she just made this decision and didn't really think about the consequences of it. So even though the three of them were taken into custody in 2002, their trial actually didn't begin until many years later in 2006. In May of 2005, Suzanne was granted bail by the Supreme Court based 
based on a habeas corpus through which a suspect can complain about being kept in unlawful custody for a long period of time. So she got out of jail and was put under house arrest as she waited for her trial to begin. The day that she arrived home, someone had spray painted the word bitch on the wall of the family's home. Now, as soon as she was freed from jail in the meantime, Suzanne launched a lawsuit to try and gain control of her parents' estate, which was valued at $5 million. Now, it's really insane that this is the first thing that she did. I don't know if she tried to reconnect with her brother who was still living at the property. I don't know if she tried to like apologize to him and just like fix things. I mean, the only thing she really cared about was money. What's crazy is that Suzanne actually became pretty close to winning the lawsuit until investigators found a revolver hidden inside a teddy bear and became concerned about Andreas's safety and she didn't win the lawsuit. Now, by this time, the case had become really popular in the media. People just couldn't believe that something like this would happen to an affluent family. And Suzanne was known to be so shy and just kind of like kept to herself. So she didn't seem to have it in her to do something so terrible. So the public was honestly wondering if maybe Daniel and Christian were the real masterminds and they had somehow forced her to help them kill her parents. Now, while some people felt like sympathy for her, other people thought that, you know, the opposite, that Suzanne was a mastermind and that she had somehow convinced and forced Daniel and Christian to help her. There was actually this TV interview arranged by her lawyer, Denny Valdo, and in this interview, it's like really interesting. I will link it under my YouTube video so you guys can check it out. But in the interview, Suzanne says that she was not the driving force behind the operation. She didn't deny her involvement, but she just said that it wasn't her idea. You know, she admitted that Christian didn't know as much as Daniel and she did. In another interview, Denny Valdo argued that Suzanne had no motive to kill her parents at all. He said that she was innocent and thought of Daniel as a god and was just like under his spell and just wanted to do whatever he wanted to do. Her lawyer, Denny Valdo, said that Suzanne was just a young girl led astray and she was forced into doing an unthinkable thing because she desperately didn't want to lose her boyfriend. Because again, the parents just wanted them to break up, so maybe he told her like your parents want us to break up like we have to kill your parents so we can be together and she just was like okay like let's do it now for these interviews Suzanne wore a Mickey Mouse t-shirt and hair clips like she was a little girl but in reality she was 23 years old so it was definitely an interesting choice of like wardrobe Suzanne was like holding onto her lawyer's arm she was crying she claimed that her most precious family was taken from her by Daniel who had also forced her to do drugs with him the interview is just really odd it just feels very forced. Suzanne also said that if she had never met Daniel, then none of this would have happened. She kept crying and saying that Daniel would force her to do stuff by saying, quote, if you love me, then do this. She just says that she felt so manipulated by him. Now, at this point when she's doing these interviews, it had been a couple of years since the murders had taken place. So at this point, Suzanne and Daniel had actually broken up. Yeah, the day after they were both arrested, they broke up. So that's pretty much why Suzanne was putting all the blame on Daniel because they were no longer together. So there was really no need to protect him anymore. Now, Suzanne and her lawyer's efforts to kind of throw Daniel and Christian under the bus didn't really work out because in one of the TV interviews, Suzanne and her lawyer were talking and they thought that the camera wasn't rolling yet. Like they thought that their mics were off, that no one was listening to them. But in reality, the camera was rolling and the mics were on. So they actually picked up a conversation between Denny Valdo and Suzanne in which he was telling Suzanne to cry a lot, to seem really sad, to seem distraught, and to basically just tell reporters that she was too overwhelmed to talk about what happened. The mic also picked up the lawyer telling Suzanne to say very specific things about Daniel, you know, to say that Daniel would force her to do certain things, to kind of just make it seem like Daniel was crazy and manipulative. It's honestly so crazy that the mics were on during this part and they had no idea. So of course, reporters released this footage and this was just like a major blow to Suzanne's credibility as the public waited for her trial to begin. Because again, like some people did feel kind of some sympathy for her and they just felt like maybe she was a young girl that was manipulated. But after hearing the footage of like the lawyer telling her to like cry and just like act dramatic, people just started to doubt her. On June 5th, 2006, Suzanne, Daniel, and Christian were finally put to trial for the murder of Manford and Mauricia in the first degree. 200 people were in the courtroom to witness this trial. So while Suzanne blamed Daniel and Christian for the murders, they blamed her for 
for orchestrating the crime. So Suzanne still managed to remain as cool and collected as she was after her parents' murder in the court as well. She even laughed at one point, but in the meantime, Daniel and Christian looked shaken up and they were also crying. Prosecutors were focused on Christian because he was the older brother and they argued that he should have stopped Daniel and Suzanne from going through with this terrible plan because he was older and he should have known better. But when Daniel took the stand to testify, he took full responsibility for both the murders and said that Christian had nothing to do with them. Daniel also added that a year into his relationship with Suzanne, she had already been talking about wanting to kill her parents. Yeah, a year into their relationship. That's just shocking. Daniel said that Suzanne's parents were very neglectful alcoholics and Suzanne had once told him that her dad had physically assaulted her and that she was scared of him. He said that Andreas knew this and would often go into Suzanne's room to protect her from their dad. However, when Suzanne and Andreas were questioned about this they both denied that Suzanne had been assaulted by their father and denied that they were alcoholics. Daniel also recalled a day when he attended a barbecue at the family home. He said that when Suzanne had asked if she could have some ice cream Mauricia had responded by throwing something that hit Suzanne in the head. He also revealed that both Manford and Mauricia were having affairs and that their household was just like incredibly rough for both Suzanne and Andreas and that the family wasn't as perfect as they wanted to seem. According to him the parents would take out a lot of their anger on the kids especially when they were drunk and this is why Suzanne and Andreas both gravitated towards Daniel and just spent so much time with him because they wanted to get away from their toxic parents. Again, I just want to emphasize that Suzanne and Andreas have denied the abuse allegations and no alcohol was actually found in Mauricia and Manford's bloodstreams when they died. So it's highly unlikely that they were alcoholics. You know, there's a chance that the kids maybe did want to protect their parents' memory by denying the abuse, but either way, because of this evidence, Daniel didn't really have a case. Daniel also said that he only started doing hard drugs when he started dating Suzanne and that she liked smoking weed too. In fact, it was when she was high that she would talk about killing her parents. She had also told him about various ways that she would do it. Like she had said, yeah, I'm going to burn the house down while they're sleeping or I'm going to cut the brakes to their cars. So again, Daniel just really wanted to make it seem like this was something that Suzanne had planned for a long time. In the end, she somehow managed to persuade Christian and David to beat them to death, which is crazy because like Suzanne was 18 years old and Daniel and Christian were 21 and 26. So they were much older than her. They could have just said no, put their foot down and just told her to like shut up. But like they decided to just go through with it because she forced them. Now, Daniel said that the night of the murder, Suzanne was just very calculated and calm. She didn't want to see or hear anything. She just wanted it to get done. Daniel also added that the reason why he covered Manford and Mauricia's faces was because he didn't want Andreas to see his parents that way. Now, days after the murder, when Christian bought the bike, Suzanne accused Daniel and Christian of being immature and irresponsible responsible and said that she should have never trusted them to kill her parents and that's when she broke things off with Daniel. The jury was left buzzing after Daniel's testimony. I mean that was a lot to take in and even though the alcoholism and the abuse part of it was unconfirmed, the testimony did put Suzanne front and center in terms of having a motive and being the person behind the plan. They kind of liked that Daniel wasn't really denying killing Manford and Mauricia and admitted to his part in the crime. So they felt like he was just being honest. Like he was just telling how it happened. Like, yeah, I messed up. I was a part of the crime, but this is how it happened. So to them, it seemed like there was at least some truth to his testimony. The most anticipated testimony was, of course, Suzanne's. Suzanne eventually took the stand and said that on the morning of October 31st, she had gotten into an argument with her dad when he raised his hand on her for the first time. But when she told Daniel this, he convinced her to hate her parents. He was the one that insisted that she had to choose between her parents or him and that both wasn't an option. So that's why she just let him do what he wanted, which was to kill her parents. She closed her eyes and her ears in the living room while it happened. The prosecutor countered this by saying that Suzanne wanted to get her hands on her parents' money and fortune as soon as possible and could not wait for them to die a natural death. She wanted the freedom and independence of her lifestyle without having to get a job and working hard to earn money. 
The prosecution argued that all three of the accused should get a 50-year sentence. In the end, the seven-member jury decided to sentence Suzanne and Daniel to prison for 40 years, while Christian received a 39-year sentence. For the first seven months of being imprisoned, Suzanne was actually placed in solitary confinement because there was fear that she would be attacked in jail. Daniel and Christian were imprisoned in the same jail, but in different units. In Daniel's jail cell, he actually made a mural of Suzanne and her family and said that he still loved her and that he would love her forever. Three years later, in 2009, Suzanne tried to get her sentence changed to house arrest, but her appeal was denied. Then she tried again in 2011, but her appeal was denied again. Now, as for Andreas, he was now living with his grandmother who tried to give him the most normal life possible. He had also written a letter to the newspaper forgiving his sister for what she did. He said that he forgave her, that he loved her, and that he believes his parents would have forgiven her too. He was the only member of the family who visited Suzanne after she was arrested everyone else refused to. Andreas was crucified by the media for writing this letter because they wanted him to hate Suzanne, but you know, she was his only surviving close family member and you just never know what you would do if something like this happened to you. Andreas went on to get his doctorate in chemistry from the University of Sao Paulo, where his parents had first met. As Andreas grew up, his feelings for his sister did kind of start to change for a bit. He was warned by his lawyers and people close to him that since he was supposed to get half of his parents' inheritance, that Suzanne might target him when she got out of prison. So in 2011, Andrea sued Suzanne for half of their inheritance and he won. He received about what's equivalent to $300,000. He's also denied knowing anything about his parents' Swiss bank accounts, which Suzanne's lawyer said that she would have full claim to once she got out. So yeah, things with Suzanne and Andreas had gone sour. In fact, he had last seen her in 2006 when he had gone to visit her in prison after she had been arrested. Unfortunately, Andreas's life had also taken a tragic turn in the years after. He was heavily abusing drugs and he was also seen breaking and entering into a house in Sao Paulo, but he didn't steal anything. He was kind of just like having an episode, so it was like a self-destructive thing. His relatives eventually admitted him to a psychiatric hospital where, according to sources, he continues to receive ongoing care. As for Suzanne, while in prison, she started dating another inmate named Sandra Regina Luz, who was in prison for kidnapping and murdering a 14-year-old. She even shared a cell with her at one point until their relationship ended. Suzanne studied while in jail and she tried to get her life back on track. She said that she made a mistake and that she was ready to move on. Now, according to Brazilian law, if an inmate has served a sentence of six years in good standing, they can be let out on parole for special holidays to spend time with the family. So in 2018, Suzanne was granted parole for one holiday, Mother's Day which is pretty crazy. Now, of course, people were upset about this because it's not like Suzanne decided to honor her mom on this day. She didn't even go to her grave. As for Daniel and Christian, while Christian was in and out of jail on his parole holiday, he actually became a father. Then he was released from prison in 2017, but ended up going back to prison in April of 2018 on charges of assaulting his ex-girlfriend and attempting to bribe police so that they wouldn't press charges. So yeah, I feel like this guy definitely shouldn't have been let out and shouldn't have been let out on on holidays. Daniel ended up falling in love with his cellmate's sister. He actually proposed to her while out on parole holiday and they were married by Christmas in 2017. And then Daniel was released from prison in January of 2018. Daniel now goes by a different name. He has his own business and he says that he wishes to one day visit Andreas, but he's too scared to face him. Because again, like Daniel and Andreas were really close. Like they were the ones that met each other first, started a friendship, started a mentorship. So I don't know. I just think it's really sad that Andreas was betrayed by his sister and then as someone he saw as his brother. Suzanne's holiday parole was eventually revoked because she refused to follow disciplinary requirements in the prison. And at this time, she had also started dating a man named Rogerio. Now, it's pretty crazy to me that Suzanne was still in jail while the brothers have been out for years because they were the ones that actually committed the murder. Like, yes, yeah, Suzanne planned it and like kind of just, you know, put the plan together, but they were the ones that actually did it. On January 11th, 2023, Suzanne was released after serving 16 years, but she's still on 
on parole. In February, she posted on social media that she was opening an online store and people were very upset about this. Suzanne now lives in Braconga Paulista and is dating a doctor who actually has three kids from a previous marriage and now Suzanne is pregnant with their own child who she plans to name Isabella. I know it's a lot. I feel like this case is just so sad and just so many people were affected by the decision that these three people made. When I read about how Andreas is not doing well and how he started going down a dark path, it just broke my heart. I mean, he did not deserve this. He did not deserve to have his parents killed and his life ruined because of his sister and because of her greediness. It's just not fair and as I said, he did love his parents a lot and he also loved his sister. So it's just really unfortunate that his sister betrayed him in such a terrible, terrible way. It's also really sad for Mauricia and Manford. According to sources, their graves are rarely visited by anyone. It seems like they really did care for their kids. You know, they did have a lot of love for them. Maybe they were strict, but I still feel like that just does not justify murder. Just because they wanted their kids to have a good education and be successful doesn't mean that they deserve to die. Just because they didn't want Suzanne to date Daniel doesn't mean that they needed to kill them. It's horrible that Suzanne felt like the only way that she could be with Daniel and just truly live her life was to kill her parents. And for what? Just for an inheritance, you know, and just to be with Daniel forever? I mean, she didn't even end up getting money from them and she's not even with Daniel anymore. So it just all just seems very pointless. Not that there has to be a reason, you know, for murder, of course, but it's just like, I just feel like this did not need to happen. And just so many lives were affected by this decision, all because she just wanted to fight for love. But all right, you guys, that is pretty much all the information I have for today's video. I know it's just so crazy and just shocking and... I don't know, the extremes that people will go to for their partners is insane. So I would definitely love to know what you guys think about this down below. Thank you guys so much for being here and for taking the time to listen to what happened to Manford and Mauricia. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure to leave me a comment down below so I can see your thoughts on this case. And if there's ever any other cases you would like me to cover, also leave me a comment under my YouTube video or you can send me a message on Instagram. Don't forget to follow, rate, and review what happened wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to my YouTube channel, True Crime Jackie, on YouTube for full video episodes. You can also find me on Instagram and on TikTok at True Crime Jackie. Bye guys.